Well, thank you so much for being here, Tank Talk Podcasters. Thank you for hanging out with us this another fine Monday, the beginning of the week. John and I are here. We've got an awesome subject for you. What are we talking about today, John? What do we got? We are talking about the fish that every fish keeper, a list of fish that every fish keeper should keep at least once in their fish keeping journey. Now, here's the cool thing about this. I have a list and John has his own list and we didn't necessarily talk about the list while we were making them. But what was so cool is once we shared, cause we didn't want to have like duplicates and be like, Oh, you like that fish too? Okay. I agree for everything, for everything you just said, moving on to the next <laughs> one. So what was nice is naturally we both had five different types of fish, at least, at least five. I think I, I just stopped mine at five. I know you had five and we got more. So there could be some bonuses coming up here as well, but we had different fish which is pretty mm -hmm. awesome. And we didn't stick with any one particular type, right? So we have a very diverse group of fish that we're going to be talking about. Some of them are very specific species. Others, it's a group of fish that you should consider at least one time. And it doesn't matter if you have a five gallon aquarium all the way up to a 300 gallon aquarium, there is going to be something for you, no matter what type of fish you like and what type of aquarium you have. Yeah. So, and uh, and don't forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can put your list of fish that you think every fish keeper should keep down in the comments and do it before you hear ours. Then you can compare our list to yours. We'd love to get a conversation started uh, of, of what everybody would say are the, the fish that everybody should try at least once. Absolutely. I'm going to let you start. So uh, we're going to take turns. We're going to go through these fish and Obviously, if I've got anything to add to them, I will say stuff about your fish. You are free to say things about my fish as well. And hopefully, as you go through this and you and you listen to this, we're showing you, we're telling you about some fish that are awesome, but we'll also forewarn you about some things that, hey, you know what? This is a great fish. However, there are some things to consider. So it's not gonna be just all sunshine and roses with <laughs> even these fish that are some of our favorites. So John, take it away. Give us something that you absolutely love that you think everybody should keep at least one time. I, okay, listen, anybody that knows me, they automatically know what I'm about to say, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say what people think I'm going to say. Maybe I will eventually, but for this first one, I'm going to surprise some people because this is a fish that I believe is one of the most rewarding fish to keep in this hobby. I think that they make one of the boldest statements of any fish in this hobby it's the kind of thing that if you haven't seen them which it's far-fetched to think people wouldn't have seen them but if you haven't seen them when you do see them for the first time you're like well that's cool like that doesn't that looks different than everything else it's a fish that stands out from across the room easy to keep for the most part i can get into some of the things that are challenging with these fish but easy to keep, stand out from across the room, available in a bunch of different varieties. And if you want to breed them, it's not that difficult to breed them. I am talking about a member of the cichlid family, but I'm talking about the freshwater angelfish. This is a fish that I've been mesmerized by for decades. And I think that's pretty common. I don't think I'm a minority in this. I think everybody sees angels. There's a reason why they're in every single pet store in America, because they're just so striking. Yes, there are some people that give them a bit of a bad reputation because once they do decide to pick a mate and they decide to clear out that area in the corner that they're going to spawn in, they can get a little bit nasty. But if you don't have that going on, these are just some of the most majestic. This is the word I like to use is majestic to describe these fish. They're absolutely stunning. There's no other fish in this hobby. I mean, maybe datinoids are, are close in shape, but those get massive and I wouldn't recommend everybody try those. Their shape is unique. They're flowing dangly things that they have the varieties that they're available in. I mean, you just can't lose with this fish. My personal favorite is the one that a lot of people would probably call a little bit on the boring side, but the straight white or silver platinum angels that I absolutely love that fish. 
And the good thing is my wife loves them too. You cannot lose with these. The Platinums are a little bit difficult to find and they're expensive when you do find them. But I'm going to tell you, you, you get a tank and this is critical here. Jason, you can disagree with me and that's fine. I think they require a 55 gallon or larger. That's my personal I'm not belief. I disagree with you on that at all. Yeah. Okay. I mean, can you pull it off in a 29? Yeah, you can. But you know what? Let's let's let these fish reach their full potential. If you have a 55 gallon aquarium, you put I don't know, six or eight angels in there, some other com some other fish that we will probably mention on this list uh, and a, and a bunch of plants. Forget about it. That's one of the prettiest aquariums you're ever going to see and uh, if you don't try these fish at least once, you're missing out because they're they're the best. Oh, for sure, big time. And I think you mentioned the tank size, 55 gallon. I 100% agree. I, I usually say 40 breeder for me is like the bare, and I mean bare minimum, but even that, I think long-term, you need, a, you need a, a tall tank, you need a large tank because if you're an adult human being, if you were to look at the palm of your hand right now, the body alone on those fish can reach that size. And I've seen them even larger. Yeah. I had going back many, many, many years ago, I had a veil tail marble angelfish in a 35 hex. I know I just got done saying a 55 is the minimum, but <laughs> this was in the nineties and we can excuse everything we did in the last century. Okay. That's so, absolutely right. Cut me some slack. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this fish, this veil tail was well over a foot tall from the top of its dorsal tail to the bottom of its of its tail uh the the um anal uh fin it's it was crazy it was crazy how tall that fish was and i've had since then i've had the veil tails in our 150 that were about a foot tall and the the body was huge so yeah i think that recommendation of at least a 55 gallon long term is really that's a very solid recommendation but dude what about you mentioned the platinum You've got the koi. Don't forget, and now this is not a fish for a beginner, but the Altum Angels, when you really got your, your fish keeping, you know, fins under you a little bit, so to speak, uh, Altums are absolutely insane. There's the veil tails, the standards. You've got even just a standard angelfish looks amazing. You got the marbles, the black, uh, the Philippine blues. They've got a, did you know they have a green angel now? Like a straight up real yeah. And I've blues. seen those in real life. Most green yep. fish, you're like, eh, that's not really green. No, this sucker was green. So yep. it was well, very and, cool. And you mentioned Altums, uh, which I'm, I'm a huge fan of those. I, uh, when was it? I don't even know. It was 2022? Uh, yeah, fall 2022. I was in your neck of the woods. In fact, we, we wanted to get together, but we didn't end up doing it. I was there for my son's graduation from Navy boot camp. We went to the Shed Aquarium. And I'm going to tell you something. They had a, what you would expect at a public aquarium, a, a room-sized aquarium with altums in there that did not look like they were from this planet. They were the biggest angel. I didn't realize angelfish got this big. It was shocking to see these fish that from, you know, the top of their dorsal fin all the way down to the bottom of the dangly things was probably two feet. I yeah, mean, it was huge and their bodies were as big as my head. It was beyond anything I ever expected with an angelfish. And I, I, when I saw him for the first time, Lisa pointed them out and I was like, those aren't angels. That's some freaky saltwater fish or something. But no, it was Altums and I was absolutely blown away. But you don't have to see the big ones to be blown away. Let me tell you, a planted aquarium that's full of baby angels. I don't care what type they are when they're just starting to get oh, all so of their, yeah. it's the most amazing thing you'll ever see. I absolutely adore them. I am a closeted angel fanatic. People don't know this, but I love it. In fact, we have a tank right now that uh, we're getting ready to convert to an nice. all angel tank. And I'm very, very excited about that. So yeah, angelfish all day long. If you haven't had them, you're doing this wrong. What about you? What do you have as your right. first one? So I'm going to stay on the theme because you talked about angelfish. And this is my all-time favorite genus. Okay, so it's not one, just like the angelfish, there's lots of different varieties. Well, with this particular fish, there's lots of different species. It is the reason why I am wearing this shirt right here. You see this little fish right here? I'm giving it away. It's the geophagus. Uh, it is absolutely 
a show stopping fish. There's lots of different types. You've got the whole Cyrenamensis group, which includes your wine milleri, your Altafrons, your Megasema. These are fish that, depending on the species that you get, will range anywhere from around five inches, like your Geophagus tapajos, redhead, all the way up to 10 inches or more, like the Altafrons that I had in our 150 gallon tank for so long. They're, they're insane. The first thing is they are cichlids, right? Just like angelfish are cichlids. Geophagus are also cichlids. Geophagus literally means earth eater. And so what they do is they are constantly going through the, the substrate in your aquarium, bringing the sand into their mouth, kind of chomping on it, spitting it back out, and they're trying to get food out of the substrate. So this is a fish where it really does prefer a sand substrate. Being a cichlid, you do want, again, just like your angelfish, you know, you're talking about a 55 gallon aquarium. Could you do a single Geophagus tapos and a 40 breeder? Probably. But those four foot tanks are much more appropriate, especially as you get to some of the larger geos that reach 10 inches. Now you're looking at, hey, you know what? A six foot tank would be even better. Sure. But I think what attracts people to the geos is the color. And they have this magnificent iridescence. And I am telling you, if you're looking for a centerpiece fish in that larger 75 gallon aquarium or larger, there are a few fish that can rival their color from head to tail. And oh, by the way, the males and the females, both show amazing colors. So it's not one of those fish where, you know, some cichlids, especially South and Central American cichlids every once in a while are like, all right, well, the male looks cool, but now the female is not so cool. Or like your peacock cichlids where it's like, hey, yeah. I like the male peacocks and now I've got this brown tan or silver <laughs> fish that's not very appealing uh, for the females. So both of them are awesome, but not only the color, often especially the males they get these trailers on their fins on their dorsal fin and on their anal fin and on their tail fins that can trail for a couple of inches and so absolutely magnificent the other cool thing is for the most part they're not overly aggressive and so just like the angels they tend to tolerate one another decently well provided you have the right size aquarium they more or less ignore non-cichlids which is right. pretty cool they're not going out of their way to eat other fish although any fish small enough to fit in another fish's mouth is potential fish food so keep that in mind that's right but i i've had these fish in the fish room continuously now for over a decade we just recently lost our our, our big guy our main geophagus the altafrons which was heartbreaking but that fish was unbelievable unbelievable if there's a downside to them it's cost right so even at just a few inches when they're starting to color up, it's not uncommon retail price to see 30, 40, 50 bucks a piece for them. Nice thing is you can more or less keep one on its own. I know some people like to keep them in groups. I like to do that. In our 125, I've got a group of six, what I believe to be, are going to be uh, either Altafrons or Wine Milleri. They're really hard to tell apart when they're younger, but they're absolutely outstanding fish. Yeah, I don't have a ton of experience with them, but I know uh, for me, and you're you're much more expert on geos than I am, but my experiences with them is that they're they have the temperament of almost like a a blue acara, just like a. That's exactly uh, true. Yeah, yeah, it's not a fish that I have to worry about. I deal with a lot of fish that I got to worry about yeah. what they're going to do to the other fish in the tank. I don't put geos in that category. I think they're they're very even nicer than angels because once those angels want to breed forget it yeah. uh, i don't know about geo's breeding behavior but they're like you said completely striking i personally the redheads would be the ones that i would kind of go towards um i love them peaceful easy going and they're just one of those fish that when you look at them you're just like oh now that's something like they're they're just fun i don't know they're you, not the most active but they're no. they're just while they're sitting there, they're gorgeous while they're doing it. <laughs> and that tank that you have behind you, it's got Oscars, the Bishers, and the Severums. That's the perfect tank because I've had Geos with Oscars multiple times, never a problem. Geos with Severums, great combination. Geos with Angels, fantastic combination. The only caveat to that is the Geophagus Brasiliensis. It looks more like a Jack Dempsey and actually behaves a lot more like a Jack Dempsey. So that's do your anything that we're talking about here. There are always exceptions. And by the way, if we're talking about cichlids, you can always get a cichlid with some screws loose in their brain. And next thing sure. you know, they're terrorizing a tank. You're like, you guys said this would be peaceful and it killed everything. I'm like, with cichlids, you that's, always have a backup plan. Always, always, always. True. But 
other than the Brasiliensis, I have not run across geos. And maybe the Steindactin rye is a little bit more assertive, but most of them are, are pretty, pretty peaceful. And almost all of them fit into a, I say community tank. What I mean by that is a, a group of fish that are not going to be small enough to fit into the geos mouth, but like your grammies and they pretty much leave Cory cats alone, non cichlids. They just ignore them. Yeah. And you know, the, the last thing I'll say about them is, and, and this is funny, it's just something that I do. And I don't know if everybody can experience their, I don't know if their mind is like mine is, but I just look, there's certain fish that you can look at and you're like, oh, that's mean. Like that fish looks mean, but not geos. You look no. at their face and it's like, you're just looking at like your grandma that wouldn't hurt a fly. I don't know. They just look sweet. They look nice. Yeah. Uh, not only are they a striking and beautiful fish, but they just look pleasant. Like they're Absolutely. not these vicious attack animals. I, I love that about them. So yeah, big thumbs up from me on those two. I All guess right, it's you my got? turn. Yeah. So this is going to come as a surprise to no one uh, because you've been looking like, like with Jason's, you've been looking at this fish, uh, not only in the background behind me, if you're watching this on YouTube, but also on my shirt, uh, I'm known, I'm known for two fish, arowanas, Oscars. I'm not going to suggest everyone should keep arowanas. Uh, there's a very specific type of aquarium that needs to be housing arowanas. Uh, minimum of what I have behind me here, eight feet long. Can you get away for a couple of years putting an arowana in a six foot tank? Yeah, but eight foot or larger is what's required. That's not realistic for most people. So that's why I did not include arowanas on this list. But Oscars definitely are. Now, I remember a day, I remember it vividly, where if you had a 55-gallon aquarium, you were legit. Like, you, you have a tank that big? Like, 55-gallon aquariums were massive when I started keeping fish. Um, and you didn't see them like you do now, like 55 gallon tanks are a starter tank now. Whereas back in my early days, and maybe it's just me, maybe it's my lack of exposure to other fish keepers. I looked at somebody that had a 55 gallon tank as legit. Um, but I'm not somebody that's going to put Oscars in a 55 gallon tank. I'm not going to do it. I am going to re require that if you entertain the idea of keeping Oscars, you're going to do it in a 125 gallon tank. I understand there's going to be people that'll make the argument 75, 90. Okay. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just telling you, you want my recommendation 125. That's how they're going to reach their full potential. That's when you're going to see what needs to be seen with Oscars, which is their behavior, their happy go lucky, googly eyed, silly puppy dog behavior, as well as their, I'm upset and I'm going to sulk in the corner kind of behavior that Oscars will do. They'll all do it They They get pouty and mopey uh, when then, but then they also jump up and they wag their tail and they're super excited to see you. And it's, it's the most amazing thing that you'll ever see. The personality of these fish is what sells them in my opinion. And you're going to see that at its top form. If you give them the right environment, which is a one twenty five. There's not a lot of people out there that would do what I did. The two Oscars that are behind me in this 360, which are a Tiger Oscar and an Albino Tiger Oscar, are the original two. Uh, the red Oscar that I have, uh, which if you're watching on video, he just popped up right there. Uh, he was added later on. He was about eight inches when I bought him. The, the original two, uh, the... Uh, sorry, my FedEx guy just drove by. The uh, the original two, the tiger and the albino tiger, they were like two inches when I bought them and I put them in an eight foot tank. Looked ridiculous. But <laughs> to me, I was like, this is where they're going and this is where they're going to stay forever. And so I was wor willing to have these little fish in a giant tank because I knew that they would eventually grow and, and fill it out quite nicely, which they have. They're... 13 or so inches now, um, you, you have a different experience with these fish if they're in a large enough environment to really be able to, you know, 
metaphorically, I guess, spread their wings and, and do what they do. Uh, there's so many stories that I have about these fish, nightmare stories, but also sweet stories. One of the stories that I like to tell is when we had our shop, this little old lady came in uh, and she reminded me of everyone's mother, you know, sweet, older lady. She came in and she was wondering about fish foods. Uh, we sold a, a couple of different brands and she wanted to try a new fish food for her Oscar that she had at home. She had him in a 55. It's fine. I didn't yell at her. Uh, she's doing better than what most people do. And she, she wanted to get him on new pellets, but once a couple times a week, she would give this fish a treat by cutting up a Nathan's. It couldn't be a ballpark or a Walmart brand. Had to be a Nathan's all beef hot dog. She would cut that up and hand feed that hot dog minus the bread, just the meat to her Oscar. And to hear her tell that was almost like a, a mother talking about feeding their child. I mean, she was so moved by this. Like she loved that fish so much. There aren't a whole lot of fish in this hobby that you can develop that level of a bond with. And I know for me personally, I've never connected with fish the way I have Oscars. It is the same kind of a connection that you would with dogs, cats, you know, reptiles, the, the, the animals that you can actually hug and kiss and hold. It's that level of a connection uh, with Oscars. And I've never had that level of connection with any other fish. So, uh, yeah, you do need to treat them right. But I'm just going to tell you, uh, you have to keep them at, at least once in the right conditions. And you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Without a doubt. I've had them numerous times throughout my fish keeping career. We recently had, most recently, this is going back a few years, we had a few of them in a 125. And I would argue, man, even with a 125, you're cutting it real close in terms of sure. the minimum tank size. And I would agree with you. The 125 is a minimum tank size, I think, for Oscars. What people don't appreciate sometimes is the overall size. These fish, you'll hear 12 inches, 12, they will get 14 or more sometimes. And they go very, very quickly. So that tank where you're going to start them out in your 40 gallon breeder or your 55, I did that. I had three Oscars and a 55, knowing that I was getting the 125 up and running very soon. And those little one and a half inch, two inch Oscars grew to about four or five inches. I'm not kidding. Within like six weeks, I'm like, these guys have to go. Luckily, the tank was ready for them, but they they grow very, very quickly. The other thing too is a lot of people think that they're aggressive just because they're cichlids and they've got a big mouth and they can eat other fish. But you look at your aquarium that you have, you're not keeping them with aggressive fish, right? Severum, Fishers, right. they're not aggressive. They, yes, they will, they have a big mouth. They will consume fish smaller than them as all fish will. But I have seen them get ruthlessly bullied by peacock cichlids, by Jack Dempsey's, some of your, even your smaller, like fire mouth cichlids. Yep. And, and they will just get chased around a tank. I What was the one that I saw one time? It was an Oscar with, I think it was like a, somebody had it with a, a Midas cichlid or a red devil. And that was an absolute disaster because that red devil slash Midas, I don't remember which one it was, was it had that full. And by the way, the red devil at the time was probably a three and a half inch fish. And the Oscar was close to full grown and the Oscars in the corner. And so you just have to be really careful with that. But yeah, in terms of personality, I don't know if, the, I don't think there's a fish out there that can beat them personality wise. I agree. And, and I, I have that exact story almost word for word. Uh, I've had that experience myself with an Oscar and red devils. In fact, it was two red devils, but the red devils were giant. I mean, they were glorious. Some of the prettiest fish I've ever had mm -hmm. in my life. Um, these fish had been together for quite some time. Uh, like a year and the Oscar was as big as mine are behind me, you know, as close to full grown and the, the, the red devils, I don't know if they were Midas or if they were red devils. I just called them red devils. They were massive, big humps on their head. I mean, they were bruisers and that that's what they did to that Oscar. Everything was fine until it wasn't until it wasn't there. And we <laughs> go in there one day and that Oscar is laying down on the bottom and the side of that fish looked like a filet ah. that you would see at the grocery store. Fortunately, uh, we were able to pull that fish out and did exactly what we should have done. We nursed that fish. All credit to Lisa. She's the one that did it. 
she took care of that fish as if it was a child and brought him back six months or so. I mean, after a few weeks, he was swimming around and he was behaving fine, but he didn't look good. It took about yeah. six months. You would have never noticed that he was ever injured. Uh, his patterns on the side of his body were a little different. They grew in a little different, but uh, he lived a, another like five or six years after that. Um, yeah. But on the contrary, I do have some nightmare stories with them too. They are cichlids. They have big mm -hmm. mouths. They have attitudes and they can turn on you. I mean, yeah. you know, the Oscar could have turned on those red devils just as fast as the red devils turned on him. And yeah. it, you just can't see it coming. And I'm not going to live my life in fear of that. If it happens, it happens. I don't want to make it happen or facilitate it, but you know, these kind of things can happen. And guess what? They can happen with almost any fish. Probably not goldfish and guppies and things like that. But when you enter the world of cichlids, whether they're African or from Madagascar or from South America, you're running the risk of them turning and becoming serial killers with all of them. Doesn't Even discus can become mean. Sure. So uh, I don't live in fear of that. The, the pros for Oscars far outweigh the cons. I love them. I could talk about them all day. I love them so much. I have this shirt and I had another shirt that I will not say what it said, but it's, it said on it, if you don't like Oscars and then on the back, it said, you can go, I'll leave it at that. We got 500 of those shirts printed. We sold out of them in like three months. I'm just saying. That's cool. A lot of people love Oscars. <laughs> oh yeah, they do for good reason. All right. My next one. I promise you, for those of you listening, this is not going to be an all cichlid list, but we're on the theme of it right now. So I'm just going to stick with it. But I, again, I promise we made a commitment to you that we were going to have all different types of fish as we go through all of our lists. But the next one for me are the Imbuna cichlids. Imbuna cichlids are African cichlids from Lake Malawi. They are, they tend to be for the most part on the smaller side, roughly four to five inches. They get a bad rap for being very, very aggressive sometimes and not fish that you generally keep with other types of fish. And so for us with the Imbuna cichlids, a seven, 55 to 75 gallon is usually sufficient depending on the type. Imbuna cichlids encompass a tremendous number of different species. And I think where people go wrong with this fish is the fact that they maybe don't do the full research necessary to keep an Imbuna tank from devolving into an all out war. So Lord of the flies. Uh, there's some yeah, there's some combinations that I like in particular. And I know John, you've had this, these fish in your, your fish room for a long time. That's the yellow lab. That's probably the most common Imbuna cichlid. And I would consider to be one of the least aggressive Imbuna cichlids, keeping in mind that you put these fish, even with other types of African cichlids, peacock cichlids, you put these things with Oscars, they are going to rule that tank in a rather in some cases, an aggressive way. So we got to be really careful here. But if you're keeping what I like to call the Imbuna community, which is just that type of cichlid, and you com com combine, like, let's say the yellow labs with another fish I really love, which is Pseudotrophius solosi. Females are yellow, males are blue with dark blue stripes. Very striking fish. And what I love about the Imbuna cichlids is the insane, vibrant colors that these fish have. Males and we females. Yeah, we often talk about in the freshwater fish keeping hobby, these fish look like saltwater. And so we do, if we're just honest with ourselves in the freshwater hobby, you know, we, we, we know instinct, we know deep in our hearts that we cannot possibly rival the colors and the striking looks of saltwater fish. It is not possible. Right. Yes, there are amazing looking freshwater fish. However, as a whole, the saltwater fish kick our behinds when it comes to color. It's That's okay true. to admit that. And it's still okay to say, I'd much rather keep freshwater fish than saltwater fish like I would. I don't have any salt water. It's not the most important thing, the color. But these Imbuna cichlids, when you see them, it's like, oh, wow, these are, fr I get that comment all the time. Those are fresh water. Yep. So in a, in a in Imbuna tank, yellow labs with Pseudotrophia solosi, maybe throw some rusty cichlids in there. You get like this purplish color. I love that combination. And I promise you just with that combination, you're getting blue, you're getting yellow. The female solosi are more of a fluorescent yellow. The rusties are giving like this purplish color mm -hmm. and they're very, very active, which is cool. So if you want a tank where the fish are constantly swimming around, 
The community dynamics are really awesome where they're interacting with one another. They build a hierarchy. And if you stock them properly, usually it takes some overstocking. So on a 75 gallon, I've usually got 20 to 25 and Buna cichlids in that tank with minimal amount of structure. So they really can't claim a, a, a territory all for their own. And I've had fantastic luck with these fish. And I've been keeping them since, if you watch the first podcast, since probably the late seventies, early eighties. And I didn't have the problems that a lot of people have, but I'm also not, I'm not packing my tank full of demasoni and erratus or the entire erratus group. Uh, I'm not putting in the bumblebee cichlids for the most part, because when you start putting in those heavy bruisers, then you have a lot more problems. So, but in Buna, I think are something once you're experienced. And so I'm not recommending this for somebody who's an inexperienced fish keeper, but once you've you understand community dynamics in an aquarium. You understand water parameters. You're not afraid of seeing fish work out their hierarchy within a community. It can be an absolutely f striking aquarium. I agree. In fact, I agree so much that four years ago, I got, I bought a 240 gallon tank exclusively for the purposes of filling it full of yellow lab cichlids. I'm fortunate in my career to have befriended the people who've discovered these fish from Africa. Uh, I know the guy, and I think you've met him too, that uh, that named the Demason eye cichlid. His name is Leif Demason. I've yeah. been to his house, um, and, and I will agree that he happened to discover and name a fish that does happen to be on the mean side, but you want to talk oh, about yeah. a striking tank? Uh, you fill a fish, uh, a tank full of nothing but demasoni forget about it that's a gorgeous yeah. tank but to me you know i've fantasized about it for a long time on my youtube channel i want to get a tank i want it to be completely blacked out full of nothing but yellow labs i did that i loved it and then i filled it full of a bunch of naturally colored rocks so it's no longer all black anymore <laughs> but what that's done is allowed them to to perform a lot of their more natural behaviors. Now that they have all of those rocks, they can claim those areas, which you were talking about, which is risky when, yeah. you know, because now you're going to introduce defense of those, those areas, but you're also going to introduce breeding. And so I can be yeah. sitting here looking at the tank and I can see little fry po heads pop out from the rocks. It's amazing. It's so much fun. I am a sucker for these fish. Um, I agree with you if you, you didn't mention zebra, but anything that ends in zebra, uh, erratus, demasoni, bumblebees, these are the ones that are notoriously uh, on the meaner side and they have the reputation they have because they earned it. Uh, but if you're getting something that ends in Afra or uh, libidochromis, generally you're gonna have less headaches uh, particularly yeah. if you do what I've done, which a lot of people don't do, and you stick with one type of Mbuna in there. A lot of people don't want to do that. They want to mix it up and have all the colors. I get it. I've done that too. Mm -hmm. But there's something to be said about having all bright blue cobalts in there or all red zebras or all yellow labs. I saw one tank way back in 2007. I saw a tank that had nothing but yellow labs in it. And from that day, I said, I want to do that. It's amazing. And uh, and now here we are. So yeah, I'm with you 100%. I wish I could disagree with you on some of these fish, but no, uh, in Buna's, I'm all in. Sign me up. I'm ready to go. And to clarify too, when you're talking about structure, I was referencing a 75 gallon. So just the sheer volume is not, sometimes it's really hard for fish to figure out how to protect that structure in a small volume. You're talking about a 240. 100%. You pack that tank full of structure and let them do what you're going to do. And you brought up such an important point, and that is fish behave differently. In, and you tend to have less problems, especially with cichlids, when you have one species in the aquarium. It's a lot easier for them to communicate. It's a lot easier for them to figure out their hierarchy as opposed to the more fish you add in that are different species, or especially if you start adding in fish that are not of the same genus or even in the same region then you you can definitely introduce more complication to your query for sure you bring those outsiders in you're asking for it yeah yeah <laughs> all right so, what you got are, are you getting us off the cichlid thing now or are we uh, are we still going i'm taking us away from cichlids but it doesn't mean i'm going to go with a fish that's particularly nice okay. in fact this fish can be so mean 
to other particular fish that it has been named the Siamese fighter fish. Of course, a surprise to no one, I am going to be talking about betas because what list of fish that every fish, keep, fish keeper should keep at least once, What li which one of those lists would not have beta on it? If it doesn't have beta on the list, it's just not a complete list. I understand. I'm sitting here raving about them and I'm saying the name wrong. I can't reprogram my brain to call them betas. I'm sorry. It just can't oh, happen. You just said it. It's like you said a swear word. I said it, but I didn't mean to. <laughs> you just from now on in your sleep, every time before you go to bed, every night go, better, 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 better. I'm going to bed. And then within a month, you'll, you will not be able to say anything else. I just, I, I can't do it just based on principle now. I'm known as the guy right. that says beta. And Lisa says it too now because of me. I didn't tell her to say it that way. I'm just saying she heard yeah. it from me that way first. And now she says that too. We don't need to get into all of that. It doesn't matter how long we talk about it. There's still going to be people that are going to comment on the YouTube video that are going to say, how am I supposed to take somebody seriously that doesn't even know how to say the name? Let's get past that. Let's understand that we can say things wrong and we can all still be friends. This is a fish that uh, is, is what I consider to be the first fish that we've talked about on this list so far that anybody can keep. But not everybody can keep a tank full of imbunas because they live in an apartment and all they can do is a 20 gallon or maybe they live in a mobile home that can't support a 55 gallon. Whatever it is, anybody can keep a five gallon aquarium. Anybody. A, a, a six year old can keep a five gallon aquarium on their nightstand. So that makes betas a fish that anybody can keep. And the beautiful thing about it. Obviously, they're available in all the colors, all the varieties, all the fin types, the crown tails, the veil tails, the everything, half moons, full moons, you name it. They're all available. They're all gorgeous. One of the most photographed and artistically recreated fish on the planet. One of the most popular fish on the planet. And the reason why is because, again, everybody can keep them. Whatever color you like, yeah, it's available in that color. They can go in small tanks and they do have that personality similar to an Imbuna, which I don't even know if you brought it up, but there is nothing more rewarding than feeding an aquarium full of African cichlids and they all come up and it's this frenzy and they go crazy. That is so entertaining to me. It's never not been entertaining. Obviously, you're not going to get a show like that with betas, but they will come up to the glass and they'll wiggle and they'll make it look like they absolutely love you when all it is, is they see that blurry thing. And whenever they see that blurry thing, little food drops from the sky, but it gives you the feeling that's the same thing with every fish, not just betas. That gives you the feeling that they're wagging their tail like a dog and they're excited to see you. I love that about them. Uh, they're not the easiest fish in the world to keep as people think they need care you know so many people look at betas as well you can put them in a vase stick them in the corner and they're fine they need to be taken care of just like any other fish uh you don't need to put them in a 125 with a canister filter and a, but you know an appropriately filtered aquarium this is where I'm definitely going to recommend to you sponge filters because betas mm -hmm. are weak. They don't swim very well, especially the ones that are carrying nine pounds of fins all over them. So they do need a little bit of help by lowering the current in the water. Uh, keep that current down. Give them a bunch of live plants. And this is a fish that is going to be your little micro puppy dog that's going to be in your tank. You're going to absolutely love. And uh, if you stay tuned to next week's episode, I'll be wearing a shirt that has a beta on it because I love these fish. My wife is completely obsessed over these fish. We used to sell them on our website. We've, uh, we've temporarily or possibly permanently suspended selling them, not because we don't like them, but because the postal service kept killing them. Um, <laughs> But that's that's how far our obsession went with betas is that I have a system with 300 of them on the wall that I built uh, because we just love these fish so much. So if you haven't kept a beta yet and kept them properly, you haven't truly experienced everything this hobby has to offer. Yeah, and I pretty much agree with everything you said. Moving on. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we Except the for the, the way have... I say the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I like to say beta. So one of the things I love about the betas is 
the bettas. Even when Joanna set up her nano nook in the fish room, originally she had a whole bunch of aquariums and they were just all each had a, one betta in there a piece. And it was, it was nice because you had all these different colors, all these different fin varieties, like you've already mentioned, very personable fish. The one thing I will say, if there's a downside to the betta is be extraordinarily careful where you get your bettas from. And when you were selling them, I would always recommend people go to keep, keep fishkeeping.com because you guys got bettas that were higher quality. You're going to pay a little bit more for those, but trust me, it's worth it in the long run because what I have seen, especially over the last, let's say, certainly five to eight years, the quality of the bettas at your at your big box stores have just absolutely tanked. And it's almost to the point now where if you can keep one of those bettas alive for even three years, you're like, nice job, way to go. You kept, <laughs> And it's not because the fish keeper is doing something wrong. It's because the bettas now, so many of them have severe, the, the line breeding that's occurred to get these colors, to get these fin types, in some cases for unscrupulous breeders, they're just here we're, we're kicking out all the they'll keep the best ones don't get me wrong they will take the absolute best of the best and they will keep those aside for their own breeding projects or their high-end sales you know when you see those bettas going for hundreds of dollars those are the ones they're keeping and then all the generals they just you know the general bettas they're throwing out there and if you're not really careful you wind up with a betta with some severe genetic diseases uh, tumors are far more common now the bent spines are more common yep. the prone to bacterial infections and fin rot is far more common and i think that has something to do with this line breeding where there's some genetic issues where maybe the immune systems are not as robust as they once were but just be really careful make sure ideally you're getting them from people who really observe the bettas and make sure that the ones that are leaving wherever they're selling them from are ones that are going to be giving you the highest likelihood of, of, of a long life, a long and happy life, but great fish. I think the other thing too, and you mentioned it with the equipment. Yeah. Filter, make sure the filter flow is very, very low. You mentioned sponge filters being a good option for bed is absolutely, they need a heater. That's the oh, other yes. thing too. I think the problem that so many people have is, and you hear this all the time, I bought a bed and it's just laying there on the ground. What's the, th the first question that comes out of my mouth is what is the temperature of the tank? Well, I don't know, whatever the room is, boom, there's your problem. Because, yep. and, and I saw somebody at one point did a, did a lot of research in terms of, there was some actual peer reviewed articles that were out there. And I saw it on YouTube one time and they actually looked at optimal beta temperatures and they were in the upper seventies. So somewhere around 78 to 80. So unless your house is kicking at 80 to 84 degrees, or wherever you're keeping the betta is that warm, the ambient temperature is that warm, the betta is probably too cold. And what winds up happening is their immune system function is decreased and they can't digest food as easily. So they're more tend to bloat and having all kinds of problems. So if you just have a normal home that's you know down to 64 or maybe as high as 72, you, you need a heater for that tank for sure. Completely agree. The other justification I've heard for a lack of a heater is, well, they were just in the cup sitting in the middle of the store at PetSmart or Petco. So, you know, obviously they don't No, they absolutely do. These are fish that are bred primarily in Indonesia, Vietnam, and Thailand. Singapore. In Thailand, in Singapore. Singapore. Yeah. I think that, and this, this is just my personal belief. I, based on experience, we sold over a thousand betas. Um, my personal opinion is the best fish that I saw came from Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam's most, got some really good, really good um, breeders out there. The betas that came from Vietnam were were more robust. They were larger, and it's not because they were older. It was because they they just seemed more full and vibrant, and their their scales were much more defined. The best fish that that we have uh, that we had the problem was the farm that we were buying them from got too greedy and tripled their prices during COVID. And that kind of ended the relationship there. But we did end up getting some from Thailand, which were amazing. Uh, we got them direct from, from Thailand. Um, and I, I think that it's kind of like the general consensus that the industry says the best betas come from Thailand. Um, but in my opinion, the best came from Vietnam. If you're someone that's looking for one, if you can find one that is a retailer that sells fish that were raised in uh, Vietnam, I think you're going to be doing good. And do not, I repeat, do not look into 
how these fish are bred at the farms, how they're sorted, how they're distributed. Don't do it because you're going to think that these animals are being abused and they're, I don't like the way it's done, but they're really not being abused. Uh, it's not pretty, but it's the way it's done. It's the way it's been done from the beginning. Uh, you know, if you're sensitive to that kind of stuff, just don't watch it. It's not like they're slaughtered and, you know, it's not anything yeah. gruesome. It's just, you're going to be like, I can't believe they, they raise these fish in these conditions, but yeah. it, it's not as bad as you think. So what is your next one? Uh, for me, I, I, I can't wait because uh, we're going to finally start getting into fish that people are not expecting me to say, but you're next. So what is, uh, what's your next one on the list? I, I, I promise this is my last one. I have one more stickler to talk about, and then I'm getting away from them for the rest of the time. The last one, and it's a tiny, tiny one, and that is, and it's not one species, but it's a group, and it's the shell-dwelling cichlids. If you've seen Primetime Aquatics, you know that we've got a 50-gallon low boy with a fish called Neolamprologus multifasciatus. If you're trying to search for them, just type in multi-shell-dweller, and they will pop up everywhere. But th that's probably the most popular one. And so if I could recommend one, it would be the Maltese. And these shell dwellers are tiny fish from Lake, Lake Tanganyika. They max out right around maybe an inch and a quarter. The males might maybe an inch and a quarter, maybe a really big one, slightly larger, but they're absolutely tiny. Now, what's so cool about these fish is like most Lake Tanganyikan fish, they don't have like insane amounts of color. They're usually going to be like a silvery color. The Maltese have stripes, but they also have these really pretty blue eyes. But what's so cool about them is they live in shells just as the name implies. And we just get these little escargot shells from Amazon, throw a bunch of them in the aquarium. They call the shells home. And so it's really cute. You can put them in a small tank. Like if you've got a 20 gallon, that's going to be plenty to start off a little colony. People often ask, Hey, how many can you, how many should I get? Get a half a dozen, throw them in a 20 gallon, better you got a 20 long, let them get themselves situated, grow to breeding size. And I promise you, you will get multiple multis. It's just going to happen. <laughs> and what attracts people to these fish and certainly what attracted me to these fish and why they have been in our fish room for since the time we started it is there are few fish that have more interesting community dynamics, the way they interact with one another than the multis do, than the shell dwellers in general. They are very, very personable, but they are always communicating with one another, whether that's males communicating with other males about territory, but not super overly aggressive most of the time, whether that's pair bonding, and you'll have multiple pairs usually, especially after you get a colony up and running all with their different shells. And there is nothing cuter than when you see little, very, very tiny baby Maltese just getting the courage to stick their tiny, tiny, tiny little face out of a shell and look around at the bigger world around them. And then the mom comes in and rushes them right back in. And then <laughs> as they get a little bit older, those, the larger they get, the more adventurous they feel. And so it's not uncommon to be like, what was that just peeked out of the shell? It's like a little sliver. And then next, you know, you got like four or five that are just hanging out right by the mouth of the shell. And then pretty soon they're a little bit further and they go further away. And then they start their own little colony in that same tank. And they're not, again, in terms of managing aggression, they just, they deal with it, right? They're going to deal with it. They will deal with their own territorial disputes. Generally speaking, they do it in a relatively non-lethal way, which is cool, <laughs> unlike a lot of other cichlids. If you're somebody who loves an aquarium that is pristine looking, these fish may not be for you because they are going to stack as part of the enjoyment of these fish. They will stack sand all the way up to the top of the aquarium. Well, maybe not quite that tall, but they do stack sand everywhere. They dig pits, they bury shells, they do unbelievable things. And so really easy to keep. Again, not a fish I would necessarily recommend for a beginner, but if you have been keeping fish for, let's say, a year or two, and again, you understand water parameters, these are fish that like higher pH, uh, higher water hardness, kind of like the Imbuna that we talked about earlier. But, oh my gosh, outstanding fish. Now, retail prices can vary dramatically throughout the country. Like for me, when I bring them to swaps, they're three bucks, maybe four bucks. They're dirt cheap. You go to a retail store, you might spend 20 to 25 bucks a piece on them. I think that's insane because most people who have them, they wind up breeding. And I think at some point that will eventually trickle into a lot more of the, the retail side of things. But, oh my gosh, absolutely a fish that you should try at least one time. It doesn't, you don't need a big tank. Yeah. And that's, you know, 
I don't have a ton of experience with them. I do have some, but um, it, it, the first thing I'll say about them is when you think African cichlids, you don't think about these fish. Like no. for me, my mind instantly goes towards peacocks, haps, and bunas. And then if yeah. we're talking Lake Tanganyika, it's frontosas and and right. um, uh, why am I drawing a blank? Compressiceps and things like that. Yeah. Diddy comps. I, I love those kind of fish. You don't think about these little dainty, cute little guppies of the African cichlid world. They look yeah. nothing like guppies. Uh, they're I believe equally as pretty as guppies, maybe not as colorful, but, uh, but the, the, the thing that is appealing about them is exactly what you said. It is the watching their behavior, watching them create a community and they will breed like guppies. If you, you know, provide them with their little shells and all of that. Uh, I, I think probably the only drawback to them is you're not, first of all, they're not going to be in a heavily planted tank. You're not going to be in a highly aquascaped tank. They're going to pretty much figure out all that on their own. They're not going to move the big shells around. At least I haven't seen them do that because the shells are too big. But um, it's, an, it's a style of aquarium that's not going to be appealing to everyone. Um, just like an almost bear tank like I have isn't going to be appealing to everyone. You want stacks of rocks or driftwood and, and plants and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's pretty much one way, and at least as far as I'm concerned, you're going to decorate a tank with shell dwellers. But to me, that's what makes them appealing. And I love that. I, wa I love watching the behavior. I've looked into your multi-tank that you're talking about and it's, it's adorable. I love it. Yeah. So uh, that to me is is one of the most appealing things about it. Just watching the community type behavior with them, and they are adorable, cute little fish that will reproduce like crazy. So, yep. if you want to facilitate something like that and be entertained by that, you will not be disappointed with those fish. All right, what you got? All right, this one. I don't think it's going to surprise anybody because I talk about these fish all the time, but. They have to be talked about because this is one of those fish that it's a schooling fish that when you see a large group of these fish going back and forth with each other, it's just one of the most majestic things. And the individual fish themselves are striking with the bright red head and the striped black and white tail. I'm talking about rummy nose tetras. This is a very common fish. I've actually got a very sad story about a rummy nose. Um, so easy to keep. You do not need to worry about them fighting with any other fish in the tank. You need to worry about the other fish fighting with them, but you don't need to worry about rummy nose hurting anything. They're not a small fish like Maltese in that you can put them in a, you know, I don't know how small you would go with Maltese, but I don't like rummy nose in a 10 gallon or 15. I'm going to say 20 long minimum, but probably even bigger than that. Bigger is always better in fish keeping. Insert. That's what she said. Joke here. It's it applies to every single fish except for maybe betas. You know, uh, the bigger the tank, the, the harder it is for them. But pretty much across the board, every single fish, the bigger tank is going to be better. Um, with rummy nose, I, I, we have them in a 125 there's like 24 of them and they're just all as this big swarm going back and forth nonstop. It never stops. You're not going to kill these fish. Well, if you're an idiot, you can, but, you oh, Siri's asking me if I need help. Nope. I'm good. Uh, Cause you call somebody an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Rummy knows they're going to be super easy to keep there. You don't have to worry about the aggression. They're super easy to feed. They're going to aggressively go after flake foods for the most part is all I'd give to them. Uh, the more space you give them and the more of them that you get, the more of a show you're going to get. And, you know, it's not all about that. The way each individual fish looks is much more beautiful than people probably think. Uh, Rummy knows you got to try them at least once, but don't make the mistake of buying two of them and mixing them in with your other Tetras and your barbs and your, uh, no, get a large group of them. It doesn't have to be a tank exclusively for those fish, but get a large group of them with some center centerpiece fish like angels or discus or something like that oh 
there ain't too many things better than a tank with a big swarm of rummy nose tetras in it i i agree uh rummy nose are awesome i think sometimes people underappreciate just how big they can get you know they just assume that they're going to be green neon size or something like that when i did my right. species profile on that fish i showed showed rummy nose pretty much close to full grown that were approaching two inches mm -hmm. and they were outstanding looking you know again like you said a lot of people like to keep them with angels or discus which is pretty awesome often what you'll find in retail stores is you'll see there's two different ways that they will be sold either tank raised or wild caught you're going to have usually way better luck with the tank raised rummy nose strains the wild caught can be a little bit more finicky the one thing i will say about the rummy nose this has happened to me twice i have never in my life seen a fish in quarantine go from looks fine is that a spot everything is dead <laughs> so, yeah i've had that too. i have never seen a fish go from oh they're gonna be okay oh is that ick next and i'm like i'm the hot the next day they yeah. were covered and i mean just covered and i'm like i lost every single one of them and i've had that happen to me twice and again and just like you with when you had the store when you bring in so many high volumes of fish you're like okay this is this is somewhat unusual so th the point is just quarantine them. And, and if you can find the ones that specifically say tank raised or tank bred that doesn't necessarily mean that they were locally bred but it just means that they were they were tank raised from somewhere as opposed to wild caught and especially if you can get the ones that have been biologically isolated even if they were wild caught from the wholesaler and from the the um, uh, you know, whoever is, whoever is exporting the fish, that's even better. Yeah. My, my nightmare stories, uh, I've got two, one of them, you know, you just couldn't see it coming. And the other one is just a, just a complete and total, like very, very sad situation. But uh, the first one was Lisa had a large group of them, probably 24 of them in a 125 with her discus and business as usual. You know, she did a, I think she did like 25% water changes in that tank. Uh, it's a 125, so it's not something she had to do every week or anything like that. But uh, she would go in and, and do a water change. She did one day, uh, just like normal, same procedure that we always do. And uh, came back in the house. This is when the tank was in the garage. She goes back out there like 30 minutes later. Every single rummy nose Tetra is stuck to the intake of the filter. Gone dead yeah. um and it you know we found out later that the, the the water company had done some big flush or something like that oh, which surprises me it didn't affect the discus at all and yeah. discus are known for being you know a little bit on the fragile side didn't affect the discus at all every single nut rummy nose was dead yeah. stuck to the intake so that was uh that was really really bad the other one is Lisa and I, in 2022, we moved from Virginia to North Carolina. It was about three and a half hours away. Uh, it was the longest day of my life was when we moved the majority of our aquariums down here. We've acquired a couple more tanks since we've been here. Uh, we didn't have to move those, obviously, but we had a lot of big tanks, two 240s, two 125s, the 360, a bunch of 75s, and all the others. It was, a, it was May when we moved, so it wasn't cold, but it happened to be kind of drizzling all day. So the, the, the just misty rain kind of made it chilly. Um, it was just a miserable day from 6 o'clock in the morning until 3.30 a.m. when we finally finished up getting everything situated in here. Throughout that entire process, transporting all these fish, we lost one fish all the tanks that we have all the beta tanks that lisa has all the africans we lost one fish and that one fish was a rummy nose tetra <laughs> well he sacrificed himself for the greater good i suppose i tell you it i really wanted to be able to say hey listen we made the whole trip a complete success we didn't and lose didn't anything yeah, we lost one daggone rummy nose. And you know what? I could have lied to everybody and just not told them about that. 
but I'm somebody kind of that believes the in the bushes while you're coming up the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody would have known. Cause there was like 24 others. So you wouldn't have even known that it was gone. But, uh, but yeah, we, we lost that one Remy knows, but that was it. So. That's, that's sad, but they are, they are an awesome fish and you, that very appropriate fish for our fish. You have to keep at least ones. Cause the strikingness between the striking features between that red face, that silvery, almost a blue iridescent body when they're really fired up. And then that yep. black and white tail. Absolutely awesome. It's the tail for me. The tail yeah. is the thing that stands out the most. It's like, wow. And when they're yeah. this big, I'm, I'm giving you about an inch sign. Uh, when they're an inch long at the pet store and they're for sale for $3 a piece, you don't see that. It's right. not until they get to that inch and a half, two inch size. That's when you see that tail in its full glory. Oh, it's amazing. But yeah. we ain't going to talk about rummy nose Tetris all night long. You got your next one on the list. So I've got one and it's, it's similar in terms of its behavior to like the rummy nose. It's actually much smaller than the rummy nose. And that is uh, a lot of the rasboras, but in particular, I'm thinking about the chili rasbora rasboras for the most part are some of the smallest community fish you're going to run across. And so that's like your galaxy rasbora, otherwise known as the celestial pearl, Daniel dwarf emeralds, green kubatai dwarfs, Brigitte. You've got all these different types. They're all extremely peaceful fish. They, for the most part, school fairly tightly. In fact, as a group, I would say the rasboras school more tightly than tetras do. The chili rasbora in particular is a fish that it, if it gets to be it, always going to be under an inch, but normally three quarters of an inch and they're skinny, they're little skinny fish, but they have insane color. And so what you'll see is this extraordinarily vibrant red and purple and a little bit of orange. And you wouldn't believe a fish that's as small as a chili rasbora can be so incredibly vibrantly colored. The other cool thing is, again, they're tiny. We had a group of, I think it was 12 or 13 of them in a five gallon. And I promise you're like, yeah, that's, that's horrible. No, no, no. More than Trust enough room. I tell you, <laughs> by the way, if you were watching this on YouTube, we, I have four aquariums, they're 8.3 gallons. And the one that I'm pointing to right here uh, on, our, on my far left-hand side, your right-hand side, if you're looking at the screen, it's an 8.3 gallon with dwarf rasboras. And when I did the species profile on those, no, it was Mira rasboras. Sorry, they're all kind of the same. There was like 15 of them in an 8.3 gallon. And trust me when I tell you, it didn't look like much. It certainly didn't look overstocked. The chili rasboras, when we had a dozen of them in a five gallon fluval spec, it did not at all look like, oh, these fish are in too small of a tank. Trust me, it looked like there's still plenty of space in here. Right. So if you're, if you've got a small aquarium, especially like a 10 gallon or a 20, and you want to do something striking and you go out and get 15 or 18 or 20 of these chili rasboras and you want to see them all kind of interact. Oh my goodness. You're talking about a fish that is next level, just popping full of color and absolutely tiny. So the biggest concern that you're going to have with this fish is tank mates because even medium sized community fish can absolutely decide to snack on your, your chili rasbora. I, I, so I, there's three, there's chilies, dwarfs, and the Mira, uh, Phoenix rasbora in there. They're all really similar looking, similar size, but they're absolutely tiny. So if you're looking for shrimp safe fish, or, you know, you want to add some snails or something like that, or you've got other really small fish that are not aggressive. Yeah. Rasboras and especially the chilies are a really good option. Lisa has, I think 12 chilies in a, in a five gallon tank. It's one of the aqua top Pisces tanks. Yeah. It, it might even be the one that she escaped for the, the collaboration that she did with uh -huh. Joanna. But, um, it, it, I, I only have one problem with chilies. My vision's getting bad. <laughs> and so I struggled to see them. That's how tiny they are. Um, She's had these fish for a couple of years now and they're still, like little grains of rice and yeah. it's, you know, but uh, I, that's adorable. I love that, but it does make it like I'm in there squinting. Like I got to put my reading glasses on just to be able to see them. Uh, but that to me is what makes them so adorable. I do love how they, they form up in a tight little group and it's, it is absolutely adorable. Uh, and she has them in uh, with a tank full of shrimp 
and you never have to worry. I, I, we have a lot of shrimp in this fish house and you know, some of the tanks, we know, you know, some of the baby shrimp are getting picked off yeah. by the Danios and, and stuff like oh, that. Sure. And you know, you just kind of know that it's, it's happening. It ain't happening in the, in the CPD tank. I mean, they're, they're well, I'm sorry, not the CPD tank, the chili tank. She has a CPD tank too, but um, it, it, you don't have to worry about that. The shrimp are going right. to be able to do their thing. They could be right up next to the, the, the um, chilies and there'd be no issue there. So I love that about it. It's not a side of the hobby I can particularly partake in because my vision is so bad. Uh -huh. I can't see the baby shrimp or the baby chilies, but uh I always call them baby chilies because they're so small, but yeah, so they're, here's the they're cool cubes. thing. When we, I bring them in and when, because they're so small, pretty much the smallest volume that you can order is like five or 600 of them. Whoa. And so you'll get a couple bags, but what's, you want to talk about something that's striking, put again, temporarily quarantine, move out to other people. That's the whole point, right? When we bring these in, they're only in there for like four weeks, but 500 of them in a 40 breeder. And I'm just like, wow, I cannot tell you how incredibly striking that is. Because fish behave, these fish that are really tiny in school, they will behave differently in a school of 20 compared to 200. When you have a couple hundred of them together, their behavior is quite different than if you only have 20. And 20 sounds like a lot, but um, it, it's it's unreal. It really is. Yep. Yeah, they're cuties. And, and when I think about them, I think about uh, in the old cartoons like Wile E. Coyote and stuff, when there'd be a swarm of bees following them around. That's what I think about when I think of the little micro fish that are swimming around in schools. I, I love them. They're adorable. Uh, oh, yeah. But speaking of adorable, smaller fish, I'll move on to my last one on my list. We've been going for an hour already. Can you believe wow. that? Uh, this is one that... I'm going to talk about a, a broad range of fish. There's a lot of fish that fit into this category and you can pick any of them and you're going to enjoy yourself. They're all gorgeous fish. Doesn't matter which ones you get. I'm talking about the category of live bearers. So we'd be talking about guppies, mollies, platies, sword tails. There's quite a few live bearers and guess what? I love them all. <laughs> I think they're awesome. Now, a lot of people might poo-poo these fish because they look at them as beginner fish. I got a tank full of yellow labs and another tank full of Oscars. Don't talk to me about beginner fish. I, I'm cool with beginner fish. Uh, and I, I think they're actually doing a disservice to those fish if you call them that. I absolutely love them. I don't think people look at guppies that way, but maybe like mollies and platies. Sword tails are, are probably another level too, where you're not looking at those as entry level fish. Right. But the, the thing is, all of these fish, they're gonna do something that most fish in the hobby don't. Most fish are gonna lay eggs and they're gonna do that whole thing and you've gotta facilitate the breeding of those fish. Whereas with, with live bears, they just pop them out. <laughs> and, it's, and, they're, and you're not gonna stop them. Like the hardest thing about breeding live bears is stopping them from breeding. I mean, even you know, the funny story, I'm sure you're familiar with Diana Wallstead because how couldn't you be? Uh, you have five planted aquariums behind you. Of course, you know who Diana Wallstead is. Well, she's been here to the fish house. She's a friend of ours. She belongs to the same club that we do. And she came one time and brought Lisa two female guppies. She calls them her rainbow guppies. She didn't have a specific, they were, I don't know if they're mutts, but Diana calls them rainbows. We call them Diana's guppies. Uh, she brought these two females for Lisa and she said, here, uh, they've been in with males. So they'll probably, she'll, she'll they'll probably pop out a couple of babies for you. A couple. <laughs> a couple Jason, hundred. I swear to you, we have hundreds of yeah. these guppies from those two not now they uh -huh. haven't all come from those two a lot of them did and then those babies started having babies and those <laughs> and it's it's mayhem we've got a 100 gallon stock tank that i swear to you has 200 in it by itself and now they're all breeding 
It's absolutely out of control. And, but I love that. And we have the ability to facilitate that. Somebody mm-hmm. who only has a 20 gallon aquarium might not be able to do something like that. But for us, it's really cool. And Lisa's actually started talking to me about, hey, this is becoming a problem. We might want to consider selling some of these. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking when we go to Aquashella's this year, we're going to set up a booth and maybe she'll bring some of Diana's guppies. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Diana Wallstead is a legend in this hobby. So to have some that came from her tanks is, is a pretty cool thing. Uh, but it's not just guppies that do this. Swordtails will do it. Mollies will do it. Platties. They are really cool fish. The Dalmatian molly, are you kidding me? That's a gorgeous yeah. fish. I don't care who you are. Swordtails are beautiful. They're fun. They're super easy to keep. Super easy to breed. So they make you feel like you're a professional. Everything about them I love. And they're bright and colorful and beautiful. You can't lose. You probably got some live bears in your first batch of fish when you went to the fish store to set up your first tank. But if you haven't, you need to because they're awesome. All of them are. Yep. Totally agree. Um, I, I think guppies are one of those gateway fish like the betta that you mentioned earlier. Guppies are another one where people get them, they breed them. It's fun to see. I don't care how long you've been in the hobby. It's always fun to see fry. I don't care if they're guppy fry, shelly fry, whatever they are. It's yep. just exciting. I had a tank in the fish room called the guppy party tank, which basically was what you described. I put in, I don't know, I think it was like a couple males and maybe three or four females. And within oh, certainly less than a year, I had 200 guppies in that 20 gallon and we would just take them out and sell them to swaps, give them away. But, and by the way, as a side note, if you ever get overrun or your, your guppy tank is starting to get overrun, add as long as it's at least a 20 gallon, the secret dwarf garami and you will not have as many guppy fry i'm not saying you know if the tank is already well established with a billion guppies it's not going to be like oh there's we're back down to a normal level but you won't see as many fry anymore so i always recommend uh if you've got a tank that is a little overwhelming that's one way to to handle that just naturally right so it's a natural thing circle of life (laughs) my two of my favorite live bears one is the tiger limia and so the tiger limia is like a green fish with black vertical bars it took forever for those fish to start breeding but once they did they sort of behaved like guppies in terms of they filled up a 20 pretty quick and then the sailfin molly very different Mm -hmm. fish because the tiger limia the guppies endlers they're really really for the most part docile mollies on the other hand you got to be careful especially the sailfin mollies is probably one of the if not the largest one of the largest common live bears that you would find at a pet store adult sailfin mollies easily five or six inches very very thick body but those sailfin dorsal fins are insane i had a couple platinum sailfin mollies one male one female believe it or not in a lake tang and you can tank and they ate up all the green hair algae but to this day when people see that video like what is that they don't care about the lake tang and you can fish and all their gloriousness they're like what is that silver fish i'm like that's a female sailfin molly it wasn't even the male that they're seeing in that tank at that time so uh yeah tons of variety sword tails be a little careful with the males the males can sometimes be a little bit territorial but yeah they're you could pretty much make an entire aquarium lifetime hobby out of doing nothing but live bears and never get bored absolutely I love them. I love them all. Uh, it is a little bit of a problem right now, but uh, the the one fi- the hundred gallon stock tank that we have, we have a canister filter on there, and uh, and it's kind of close to a window, and you can walk up to that, and when the light is shining into that stock tank, and you see the mass of fish that's in there, it's unbelievable. So yeah, if you can't accommodate something like that, you need to either take measures you know, putting a fish in there that'll handle that for you and understand that you're, you know, completing that circle of life or stay away from these fish. But I think you should try them at least once because they're a lot of fun and they'll make you feel like a really good fish keeper because they'll you, you have to basically try to stop them from breeding. But moving on to the last one on the list for you, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. You're about to talk about a fish. I know which one you're going to talk about. And this is an experience or a, a fish that I have zero experience with so i'm not going to be able to add very much color commentary but i'm anxious to hear you talk about it 
Well, my last fish that everybody should keep at least once is the blue whale. I know we've been talking about freshwater for a while, but if you've got a blue whale, what else can you say? Have at least a five gallon to start out the baby blue whale, move them up to a 55, then a six foot tank, then a 20 foot tank. If you've got an ocean in your backyard, eventually move your baby blue whale into the ocean. All right. That's not true. None of that's Why true. Not? Okay. So forget the baby blue whale. Okay. We're not doing this. But you said, I heard him yeah. say it. Now, whatever I say is going to be a letdown. They're like, there, you know that there were some people like, baby blue whale, you can keep those? They're starting to look on oh. their phones. Or, Who's got baby blue whales for sale? <laughs> or, I just got one that birthed one over here in the Pacific. You want it? Uh, <laughs> no, this last one is the peacock gudgeon. And I, it's one of my all-time favorite fish. The peacock gudgeon is a fish that will rival any fish that we've talked about on our list today in terms of color. They are absolutely full of blue and pink and red and yellow color. Both the males and the females get this amazing color and they stay small. And so this is a fish that's going to, the males get a little bit longer, maybe an inch and a half, inch and three quarters. They're not super active. They work very, very well. I mean, I've kept them in a 10 gallon, 20 gallon is even a better option. I've bred these fish before. They're not exactly easy to breed. They're not like live bears, but when you get it down, this is a fish where you can, we've bred thousands of these fish, like literally thousands, because they would have these spawns where they were kicking out 100, 200, 300 at a time. It was, it was pretty insane. But we, at one point we had them in like three or four different tanks in our fish room. Some people give them, and I don't know, some people have had a, a necessarily not a great experience with them because some people have reported that they're somewhat aggressive. I've never found that. And I think the reason for that is when I've kept them in like, let's say a 20 gallon tank, I've always got like 12 of them in a 20 gallon. And it, when that happens, I think it's sort of like when you overstock a, an Imbuna tank or a peacock male peacock cichlid tank, where there's just, there's enough individuals where they're not necessarily combing territories there's too many fish to kind of defend a particular territory so i'll just get along and i've done that a million times in fact right now in a 20 a standard 20 i've got i think 18 or 20 of them in that aquarium some of them are juveniles a few of them are adults and they're insanely amazing fish they generally ignore other fish so it's not like they're chasing other fish around like i said they're they're mostly slow moving especially if you're looking for activity in the bottom third of your aquarium and you just want something that is insanely colored. I always tell people when they're looking for that centerpiece sort of fish, even if you just keep one in that 10 or 20 gallon, the peacock gudgeon is definitely an option. We just did that 50 gallon low boy. We called it the gudgeons and goby tank. Uh, they were in that aquarium. We put, I don't know, six or eight of them in that tank, just absolutely full of color. Uh, like I said, they will breed, but you have to try to breed them. So it's not like something like, oh my gosh, we're going to have 300 babies. If you leave the eggs in the aquarium and the fry hatch, the other peacock gudgeons or even the parents will eat them. Other fish will eat them. They're, they're extraordinarily tiny. Uh, so, but it's, I mean, a planted tank with some peacock gudgeons are insane. Yeah, my only experience, and I, I think I'm remembering this correctly, my only experience with those fish is being at your house in your mm -hmm. fish room and going, wow, what is that? And you were yeah. like, those are peacock gudgeons. Yeah. Oh, I should have known that. I'm a fish keeper. I should have known that. Uh, but yeah, that's not a fish that I have kept, not for any reason other than I just haven't. It's not like I'm against them. I just don't have <laughs> any experience with those. So. Yeah, they're uh, not but, terribly common. I mean, they are at pet stores from time to time, but they're not super common. And when they are there, they can be a little bit pricey. I mean, it's not uncommon to see peacock gudgeon pairs going for 25, 30 bucks, at least, if not more, uh, depending on your region, your area. We bring them to the swaps and they're not nearly that much because we have a lot of them. But yeah, they not as common, not as cheap. Readily as available. We talked about. Yeah, readily available. So. It's so funny to hear you and, and I've heard other people talk about things like that, too, where it's like, yeah, there's these fish that are they're super expensive. They're like twenty dollars a piece. And, you know, I cut my teeth in the African cichlid world yeah. where for a male peacock that's three inches long, you're spending eighty dollars a piece. I'm like, you're calling a twenty dollar pair expensive. Like that's well, cheap to me. But and I've gotten spoiled, too, because 
we import a bunch of fish. We're always at the swaps in the Chicagoland area. You get really used to seeing swap pricing. And when I go to a retail fish store now and I look at the prices, I'm like, who's paying that? Who's paying? Right. And it's like, well, hold on. It's the vast majority of the public who aren't aware of these swaps that right. are paying those prices, which is actually totally normal. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not like people are doing something wrong or they're not, I don't know, advanced fish keepers. It's just in the Chicagoland area, we have four different clubs running swaps. We have one in Davenport. There's one up in Milwaukee as well. So it's very common. So like the peacocks you're talking about, a full grown four to five inch male fully caught up is a $20 fish. That's it. That's all you're getting for them at these swaps. And I mean, they're magnificent wow. looking fish. So I, I remember being at a fish store and I'm not going to say which one because in the area that this one was in, was a no, they were normal priced. But yeah. I remember being at this fish store with you and you were just walking around with your jaw to the floor at the prices mm -hmm. of these fish. Yeah. You know, small fish that are like, you know, twenty six ninety nine a piece and you're like, what? That's, an, <laughs> so, that's a six dollar fish. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Different parts of the world. And you live in an area that's not exactly cheap to live in, but right. when you go to the right places, you're gonna find a whole lot better deals on these fish. So absolutely yeah. yeah so i think we gave people a pretty good and what's nice is we gave them 10 options but not only did we give them 10 options within those each one of those options there's multiple species so very true we could we you could be very busy keeping all of these fish from this conversation here for the next decade yeah so, we set you up forever for the rest of yeah. your fish keeping career try one of all and uh, you'll be good to go yeah you don't ever need to wonder again <laughs> That's right. And again, if you've got fish that you love, like must keep at least once in your life that you've kept and you're watching it on YouTube, put that in the comments section because we do actually like to read your comments and, and go through them. And uh, like John said at the beginning, if you have a question that you would like answered at, as, at some point, obviously we're not going to answer them all because we're just going to pick a couple uh, as we move forward in these podcasts. If you've got a question you want answered, we'll try to get that live recorded in person but not on the podcast answered <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're we're not going to get to a place where we're doing these live where real questions no. are coming in while we're you know we ain't going to do all that that's you know, that's a whole different thing i prefer it this way where we can just relax and however long it takes is how long it takes to talk about because i can go all day long so it's nice yeah. to not have to look at the clock like i gotta be done in two minutes you know right yep so uh yeah i think uh we've we, we did it we covered all the things uh thank you to everybody who hung out with us and hopefully you do have a great week and don't forget we're going to be back same bat time same bat channel next <laughs> week next monday we'll have a brand new one for you so thank Looking you forward for being to it here. yeah